In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, when you hear the phrase, John 3.16, how many people think football? Anybody out there, do you think football? You know what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? For all of those years, all of those people holding up banners and football games that said John 3.16. Back in the day, back in the 70s and the 80s, there was a guy named Roland Stewart. And Roland found his way into so many NFL football games, and he always managed to place himself in the stands right between the goalposts. He wore a massive tie-dye afro wig. And he would wear a tie-dyed shirt and he would stand between the goalposts up in the stands. And for every field goal that was kicked or extra point, he would hold this big sign that said John 316. Almost single-handedly, Roland Stewart made John 3.16 the most famous Christian piece of scripture that there is. Literally, millions of people who knew nothing about scripture, who were not interested in scripture, who still probably don't know what John 3.16 actually says, but they knew that sign. And then in 2009, Tim Tebow, who remembers Tim Tebow? Give it up for Tim, give it up. Tim Tebow, quarterback for the Florida Gators, national championship football game, college football game, wears in his eye black, you know, that you, they put under their eyes, John written on this eye black and 316 written on that eye black. During that football game, I'm not making this up, 90 million people over the next 24 hours Googled John 3.16. Fascinating. People who did have no idea what it means went looking for it. So how many of you know it by heart? Got some good Baptists out there, they know their scripture, little Presbyterians, Episcopalians don't even think about raising your hands. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In the late 20th and 21st centuries, this verse may be the most famous piece of scripture in Christianity. Now, while I admire Roland Stewart and I give Tim Tebow a little bit of credit for putting that on his eye black. I am personally not a fan of slogans, religious or otherwise. And writing John 3.16 or holding it up on the sign is a kind of a slogan. Slogans, you see, by definition, try to make things simple. But if you take something as profound as John 3.16, and you reduce it to a tagline or a bumper sticker or a poster to hold up in a football game, you run the risk of trivializing it, cheapening the deeper message. Plus, I always wonder when I see those signs being held up, which part of the verse is the sign holder most interested in proclaiming? God's love for the whole world to give God's Son, or the need for people to believe in God's Son in order to avoid being condemned? Is it an inclusive message or an exclusive message? Is it an invitation or a warning? Perhaps it's meant to be both. After all, there are two parts of the famous verse, aren't there? The first part, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That is the essence of Christianity, the proclamation of divine love. It is the good news of the Christian faith, and it's all about grace. 
It says, for God so loved the world. It doesn't say, God so loved the righteous, or God so loved the baptized, or God so loved those who sit in the front row of church, or God so loved the progressives. It says, no, for God so loved the world, all of us, every sinful, broken, struggling one of us, agnostics and atheists, the self-righteous and the prideful, clergy and laity and everybody else in between. And not only does God love the whole world, but God loves us so much that God sends us his son. In much the same way that Moses in our lesson, first lesson this morning, was told to raise up a bronze image of a serpent on a pole to save the Israelites from snake bite. God gives us Jesus' son. God gives us Jesus, his son. And Jesus is raised up on that cross. And in so doing, God saves all of us who are snake bit by sin and death. This is God's self-sacrificing love for you and for me and for all of us. I'm reminded of an ancient Bedouin story. Bedouins, you know, are the desert dwellers in much of the Middle East. During a heated argument, a young Bedouin man struck and killed a friend of his. Knowing that the ancient customs of his people and that he himself would then be put to death, he fled and he ran across the desert until he came to the tent of the tribal chief. And there he went looking for sanctuary. The old chief, honoring those traditions of hospitality, took the young man in and the chief assured him that he would be safe until the matter could be settled legally. The next day, the posse arrived. Those who were chasing the young man to arrest him came, demanding that he be turned over to them then and there. They wanted to execute him right then. But the old chief said, I have given my word that he will be safe, and I will not turn him over to you. The posse those looking for the young man replied, but you don't know whom he killed. I have given my word, the chief repeated. Just then someone in the crowd blurted out, but he killed your son. The chief was deeply and visibly shaken. He stood speechless for a long time. The accused and the accusers were waiting for him to say something. Finally, he raised his head and he put his hand on the shoulder of the young man and he said, then this young man shall become my son and everything I have will one day be his. This is exactly what God does. God gives us his son. We are the ones who nail him to the tree. You and I, all of us, crucify him. And what does God do? God turns around and says, then therefore I make you my children. And everything I have will be yours. That kind of love, that kind of divine love is called agape. Agape, God's love, love freely given, love given without cost, without deserving. At the cross, we encounter this kind of love in its purest form. And it is the central Christian message that God cares so much about us that the divine stoops down to become human in order to save us. Jesus comes and gives his life for all of us, 
all of us, regardless of our color or our gender or our race or our sexual orientation or our education levels, it doesn't matter. This is what the church calls the missio dei, the mission of God to save every single one of us. That's, as you can probably tell, my favorite half of that verse. That God so loved the world that he gave us his son. It's the part that gives me deep meaning, the part that makes me feel so connected to God. That, that Jesus came for me. That I am God's precious child. That you are God's precious child. And it's wonderful because it's all about grace. It's all free and unearned and undeserved and unasked for, just given for us in this incredible way. Now, for some people, this is as far as they want to take the passage. Quite frankly, it's as far as I like to take the passage. God loves us, we are saved, end of story. God loves us, we are saved, end of story. But there is a second part. So that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. The fact is, God's love requires a response from us. God's love requires, demands a decision from us. If it's only about grace, and there's no room for us to accept it or not, then it's not free. Yes, God loves us unconditionally, and there's no way we can earn it, but Jesus teaches us that the proper response to this love is to believe, to trust, to say yes to God. Sola gratia, sola fide. We are saved by God's grace, and we are saved through our faith. For John, now, it's important to understand that belief is not just something you have in your head, like you have the right ideas in your head. That's not what belief means to John when he says this in our gospel for today. For John, belief and faith are action verbs. They can never be reduced to simply having the right thoughts. Believing and having faith are things you do. For John, to believe is to be obedient. In this sense, to have faith in Jesus, to believe in this good news of what we're given, is to do all that we can in our own lives to make Jesus' way of life our way of life, to model our living on his living, to live our lives in service and sacrifice as he did. Harry Emerson Fosdick, who was perhaps the greatest preacher of the first half of the 20th century, once said, for faith to be genuine, it has to be our own. We have to own it. So many church members are second-hand Christians. They have inherited it from their families, or they've borrowed it from their friends, or they've married it or taking it over like the cut of their clothes from the fashion of their group. They aren't disciples, he says, they are spectators. This is what Bonhoeffer would call cheap grace. The truth is, God loves us without condition, and at the same time, God invites us to respond to that love with faith that is personal and passionate and drives us to be faithful followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no escaping the tension here. There is tension. 
God's love is offered, it is free, it is unreserved, it is given to all. There is no special club of those God loves and those God doesn't. But love requires a response. And that response is faith in action. On this fourth Sunday of Lent, we are now 21 days from Easter. This is called Latere Sunday, Rejoice Sunday. It's the day, the Sunday, when we're supposed to lighten our Lenten loads a little bit and to rejoice in something besides looking at our own sinful nature. And so the lesson we have today is this wonderful piece of good news. So as we move our way to Easter and draw a deep breath and prepare ourselves for these days leading up to Holy Week, rest assured that God's love for you is free and unreserved. There is nothing exclusive about the cross. Christ offered his life and his death for the whole world. Rest in that grace. But at the same time, look deep. Look deep. Is your faith a living faith? Is your faith an action verb? Or is it only a second-hand inheritance? Because the gift, the gift is so wonderful that it deserves a response. And the grace is too sweet for us to remain as spectators. Amen.